Okay, Chell. So back in season nine, we did a new segment about the Kroger Albertsons merger and how the FTC had filed a lawsuit to try and stop them. Right before I left for my mini vacation, as you called it, I saw a news article that really piqued my interest. I forwarded it to you and I said, while I'm gone, can you dig into this and see what you find? And so I'm really excited for you to share what you have learned today with us. Yeah. So the you know article that you sent me and, and what got me going down the rabbit hole was yeah. really this story that we saw where Kroger and Albertsons have announced an amendment to their merger in an attempt to sort of, as one of the um, articles called it, like sweeten the deal, right? right, And try to get this merger passed through. And that amendment was to really the number of stores that they were planning to divest to C&S wholesale grocers as part of this proposed merger. Okay. So the updated plan would actually see I think that originally it was like over 500, but now as of today, their plan is to divest 617 stores to CNS with the top states like being affected by this Mm -hmm. being Washington, Arizona, both of which would have over 100 grocery stores divested. Okay. Colorado, California, and Oregon. Okay. So Charles, part of the reason, and just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page here, that the divesting of locations is happening is because of this idea of a grocery monopoly, right? Like too much ownership of grocery store locations. And so in an attempt to get this merger passed, they, you know, Kroger Albertson said, you know what, we'll get rid of some stores. So we don't have too many, right? And then maybe this will pass the FTC's you know, it'll be to their liking and this, this will get approved. Exactly. And so in doing this, right. And turning these stores over to CNS, it, uh, you know, creates potentially competition for a newly merged Kroger Albertsons line of stores essentially. Right. And so that's why they feel like bringing that number up to these 617 stores will really show that they are not trying to create a monopoly. Right. right? And for those of you not watching on YouTube, she was making air quotes um, (laughs) as she did that. And, And the reason we're talking about this, Chelsea, is because on the surface, one might say, okay, good. They're going to get rid of more stores. They're going to help maintain a monopoly. But the reason that this article caught our attention was because it was calling out how this is actually not a good thing. No matter how many stores Kroger Albertsons was to divest, the outcome of this merger still does not look good. Yeah. And Kroger and Albertsons are definitely trying to paint the picture, right, of how Mm -hmm. this will be good for everyone. So according to Kroger's own website, this is what I found there, the updated divestiture package includes increased distribution capacity through a combination of different and larger facilities. The package also expands the corporate and office infrastructure provided to CNS, Mm -hmm. given the increased store set to ensure CNS can continue to operate the divested stores competitively and cohesively. Now, I think most people are not going to know CNS Wholesale Grocers, Inc., right? They were founded in 1918. They are the largest wholesale food supplier in the United States, and they moved into grocery operations in 2021, so three years ago, with Grand Union and Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly, I, as I understand it, they purchased during a bankruptcy like transaction. So, you know, they, it's interesting how they even got into the grocery industry. But as of today, they're operating 23 grocery stores and one pharmacy. In this divesture, they would be taking on 617 stores. I mean, that is a big undertaking and quite a jump. Yeah, and we've actually seen this before, Sarah. Mm -hmm. During the Albertsons-Safeway merger, which happened in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. 
the two corporations divested 146 stores to a grocer company called Hagen. This actually led to Hagen filing bankruptcy within six months of the divestiture. Yeah. At that time, it gets better. <laughs> At that time, when they filed bankruptcy, Albertsons then bought back 44 of those locations what? and paid as little, yes. And for some of them, they paid as little as $1. That is wild. But I'm sadly not surprised. One dollar. So they yeah. divested and then they bought back 44 locations at one dollar or as little as one dollar. And then we also saw within that bankruptcy that 10 other locations closed permanently mm -hmm. and 17 more were actually converted to either like hardware stores or gyms or um, I think in one case, there was like one got converted to a hotel, but they were definitely not any businesses that were selling food. Right. So this story, the story of Hagen, yeah. has actually become a key piece of evidence in the FTC's case against the Albertsons-Kroger merger, which actually heads into trial this month on the 26th in Portland. Kroger and Albertsons will argue that Hagen's and the C CNS divestitures are totally different scenarios. Mm -hmm. I actually have a quote here from Scott Moses, who is the head of grocery, pharmacy, and restaurants for Solomon Partners, who's actually consulting for Albertsons. Mm -hmm. And this is from the Bloomberg article, which is one of the articles that we're going to have linked in the show notes that we researched in in bringing this story to you. So Scott Moses actually said, Hagen's small size and limited capital capacity made it difficult to invest in prices and sufficient marketing. They rapidly expanded to eight times their size. I want to pause there for a second, Charles, and just grab my calculator real quick. Uh, 617 divided by 23 supermarkets would be 26 times growth for CNS. So if Hagen's, you know, rapidly expanded to eight times its size and things didn't work out well, I think I know the direction that this story is going in, seeing as how CNS would be expanding by 26 times its current size. Yeah, absolutely. But Moses would argue. Sure he would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That CNS is a seasoned acquirer, right? We already talked about that they acquired Piggly Wiggly's assets. This is something that they're familiar with. But CNS is primarily a wholesaler, mm -hmm. although they do have an estimated revenue of $35 billion just last year. Right. But frankly, the FTC sees things differently, right? So mm -hmm. in its lawsuit to block this Kroger's Albertsons deal, the FTC actually quoted emails from CNS's then CEO, Bob Palmer. These emails were to the incoming CEO, Eric Wynn. They were like putting together a draft of a press release about the divestitures. Okay. And Bob actually said, do we have to say that we won't close stores and in the parentheses, it says the all, in quotes, is a problem. Right. The trick is that they they stay open as they transition. But then what? Are we committed to this? The trick is? So this is CNS. Yes. <laughs> okay. So you're hearing right here in these emails that CNS isn't necessarily even committed to these stores staying open is what it sounds like they're saying. Yeah. But then we hear from CNS saying that they are, in quotes, deeply committed to its retail expansion. This was a quote from Lauren Labruno, who is the company's vice president for communications. Although it is noted by Bloomberg that she declined to comment on how long CNS intended to operate the stores after acquiring them. Mm. In related news, I know that 
the Albertsons COO slash VP is set to become CNS's president and CEO if the merger goes through. So there's a bit of a lack of commitment that we're seeing in these emails. And we know that an Albertsons exec would be moving over into CNS's like lead role, which seems like an absolute conflict of interest. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And it also says to me, or I should say it makes me ask the question, are we really that invested in creating competition? This is the, the crux of why we're talking about this, right? Because there's the idea that, okay, divesting more stores is a good thing, right? It will increase competition. And on the surface, this seems like a positive thing. But when we dug deeper, when you dug deeper, we identified that in the past, in previous Albertsons mergers, the divested, the divestiture, which is such a tough word to say, it actually turned <laughs> into 30%. If we do the math, 30% of the divested stores actually ended up back in Albertson's hands, and 18.5% of the divested stores were either closed or converted into some other type of business. If history was to repeat itself, statistically, based on 617 stores, that would mean that 114 locations would cease being grocery stores, and 185 would return to Albertson's. And that is a problem because we've got 185 going back to Albertsons and we've got 114 locations that will no longer be grocery stores. And as you pointed out, the divestitures are taking place in specific states. So it's not like they're evenly spread out across the country and where the mind immediately goes and why this was an important article and story to dig into for us because we also recently did a story on restrictive covenants. And we know that still in this day and age, if a grocery store closes, Albertsons or CNS can have the power to keep it empty, to not allow it to turn into a different competitor's grocery store, leaving people without access to food. Yeah. And we actually saw this happen again, going back to that deal with Hagen in the Albertson Safeway merger of 2015 that we talked about. Even Hagen's hometown of Bellingham, Washington was not immune from this fallout. So Albertson's closed its Birchwood neighborhood store in 2016 after buying it back out of that bankruptcy, mm -hmm. right? It yeah. then closed the store. And this is, by the way, in a city um, that has about 90,000 residents. And this store, this Birchwood store, actually served Bellingham's most racially diverse and low-income neighborhood, including the Lumi Reservation. Mm. Now residents have to travel nearly two miles to get to the nearest Fred Meyer or a mile over to the next neighborhood to find a shop. As many as one-third of those residents don't have a car. So they are on foot now. That's so frustrating and really infuri infuriating. I, I know from looking into the articles, kind of reading through them before we got here, that the city couldn't coax another grocer to the location because Albertsons maintained a restrictive covenant that prohibited a rival from leasing the space until 2038. Yeah, that's awful. And we actually learned that Albertsons did decide or said they decided in 2023 to actually eliminate that particular restrictive covenant and to begin the formal process to do so in December of 2023. By late June, so just a month and a half ago, right, the company finally filed the papers to lift the restriction only after Bloomberg submitted questions about what was happening and mm -hmm. Washington's attorney general, the attorney general's office began an investigation. I think that's 
you know, good. Those are good steps forward. But Big Lots has been in that former Albertsons location since 2019. And they sell, you know, dry goods. They don't sell fresh vegetables and many other things that a grocery store would sell due to that, you know, restrictive covenant. And so filing the paperwork doesn't help help the people of Bellingham. Yeah. Yeah. Not at this point. No. Another impact that we saw from the uh, Hagen bankruptcy during that merger between Albertsons and Safeway was that Albertsons actually had to close 20 locations in Colorado. And 11 of those locations closed within six months of that merger. And Albertsons actually said in a statement that those Colorado closures were unrelated to the merger, but that the company decided to close their most underperforming stores after a year's worth of analysis. And now where do the people shop? Exactly. And so this is where it gets really, really bad, Sarah. Residents of Gunnison, which is home to Western Colorado University, they only have two choices. One is a Safeway that's now owned by Albertsons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And the other is a city market, which is a banner that's owned by Kroger. (laughs) Mm. The next closest grocery store, this is wild. The next closest grocery store to Gunnison is either 65 miles to the east in Mm -hmm. Salida or 90 miles to the west in Montrose. Right. So imagine if if just one of those two stores closes in this merger, Mm -hmm. A, the residents are down to one option. Mm -hmm. And if they want anything else, it's an hour at least in either direction to find it. Yeah. I think the scary thing here, Chelsea, is that it seems like there is a fairly good likelihood that one of these stores would close, right? Because you've got an Albertsons and a Kroger. You don't really need to operate two stores necessarily if they're somewhat close to one another, especially if one is underperforming or the analysis and the data show that if we downsize to one store and eliminate any other competitor from moving into the closed store, then our bottom line looks better. There's a little bit more that we want to share on this merger, and I'm kind of teeing up a a future news story here. Obviously, with this going to trial at the end of August, like we're going to be providing updates as they become available, you know, meaningful updates. But there's also some information on how the grocery stores, the consultants, right, working on this deal basically are putting every Albertsons and Kroger store into one of, I think, four buckets to decide. Does this automatically Mm -hmm. get closed? Does this get divested to CNS? So what is the fate of the stores and how does it get determined? And I think that that's an interesting bit of context to add to this conversation, you know, which I definitely want to do on another day. For now, I think what the important thing is here is to understand that even with the divestures or, or because of the divestures, we could see a number of stores close and tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people have a decreased access to fresh food. Beyond that, we're, we're going to see people losing their jobs, right, due to closed grocery stores. We know from, you know, anti-competitive moves that have happened in the past that we're also likely going to see increase in prices and a decrease in wages, right, in certain areas, if not most areas. So this is a, this is a massive and very important thing to keep our eye on, but not just that, to fight against. So if there's anything that, you know, we can do to raise awareness, that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do here. Maybe it'll be a good idea for us, Chelsea, to say, like, what can we do as individuals to try to change the outcome, try to support, you know, the FTC and not passing and allowing this merger to happen. And if we we find information on that, we'll be sure to share it with you here on the podcast and, of course, link to it in our show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. 